All right, welcome. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to be discussing praying mantis taxonomy and systematics. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I know it's a kind of complicated topic that a lot of people are not entirely sure about, so we'll be doing our best to go into the basics today and get you guys acquainted so you can have an idea about what it's about and why it's a really cool thing and can help you as a mantis keeper and breeder out. So my name is Lohi. Um, I am joined here with Josh Byron and Ben Lee. You might have seen them around in the groups. Um, I figured let's just take a minute to introduce ourselves and why we got into the hobby. So Josh, you want to start? For sure. Yeah, I've been in the hobby since I was a tiny little baby. Uh, I got my first mantis at four and I was always astounding my relatives with being able to say long bug names. So. Uh, although I've never been formally trained in taxonomy or really entomology besides some classes in college, uh, I've worked with them and, and cared for them my whole life and I'm in uh, nature education now. So behind me is some of the mantises and that's always growing and changing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my, so my name is Lohi, as you guys see. <laughs> um, I've been keeping mantises for almost 12 years now uh, since I was really young, just like Josh. Um, I only really got into fantasies scientifically um, in my undergrad at college, and it really opened another lens with which to look at these animals because mm -hmm. just thinking about the way they evolve and what led to the way they look now is a, leads to a really cool set of questions. So, uh, yeah. yeah uh, hey, I'm Ben. Uh, so growing up in Hong Kong, like one of the things is just there's bugs everywhere. And so uh, I, I just used to find bugs in the garden, and that's how it started with like, but never really got a mantis. They're a bit hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't get mm -hmm. one until like grade eight. And then I had a bit of a hiatus after that because I went, came to the US and then started again three years ago. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and didn't realize it was only three. <laughs> <laughs> ben is our resident uh, hymenopoded expert, <laughs> we'll say. Uh, so we'll, we'll explain some, some of what that means later. Um, so so let's, first, let's just start off with what is taxonomy. So taxonomy is the identification, naming, and describing of organisms. Um, and it's, it's essentially put it, trying to put the human label on an animal that we see. So we know when we see it again, we know what that thing is. And we have like a set of information about it, right? Systematics is the study the way these organisms that we've described relate to each other. So whether it's evolutionary relationships um, or like historical range relationships and stuff like that. So that's what systematics is. Um, so now, um, sorry, one sec. Um, technology. <laughs> technology. Uh, yeah, so we will go to slide two. So here um, I kind of created an infographic. It's really simple. It's borrowed this infographic specifically with the praying mantis tree of life, the phylogeny. It's from uh, Project Mantodia. So if you guys go on that website, you'll be able to see this infographic and all the cool work that they're doing related to mantis systematics. Um, it's such a pleasing infographic. It's such a really nice thing to see, yeah. Um, and it highlights the different families really well. Um, so first, let's go into how we classify the animal kingdom. Um, Josh, you wanna you wanna explain how we do that? Yeah. Um, if you guys learned like basic biology in high school, middle school, college, you probably learned some sort of acronym like King King Philip came over for good soup, or something like that, uh, to describe the different levels, like nested umbrella um, taxonomic groups that get more and more specific, which is a very uh, relevant word. But at the broadest sense, we have all of our animals that are more related to each other than they are to all of the plants, all of the fungi, um, all of the multicellular moving things are in the animal group. And from there, each group, as it becomes more related to other members of that group, more similar to them, uh, they are divided down. So you can see in that graphic, uh, if you become more specific to chordates, which have like a spinal column, um, a vertebral column, um, 
then you lose the insects, which don't have that. And everything else that does and is also an animal is a chordate. And then you become a mammal. Uh, everything that doesn't have hair, doesn't have mammary glands is excluded. Mammals are included in that group. Uh, and then the carnivores, the, the bear family, uh, which is going to have all the bear-like things, and then down to each individual species. And we'll define what a species exactly is later, but mm -hmm. everyone really, you know, once once you have grown up around animals, even if you haven't ever taken a biology class, um, like people in, people in all sorts of indigenous communities have their sense of this is this kind of animal that associates with others of its kind, and we all develop our species concepts as we observe the animals. Yep, exactly. And for the sake of this presentation, most of what we're concerned with is going to be at the family, genus, and species level, because um, we all know mantises are in one order, which is the order Mantodia, um, and they're all insects. So beneath that, this further subdivision is really what we're trying to get you guys introduced to, so you guys have a better mm -hmm. sense of within family similarities and differences and stuff like that. So. And um, just for extra clarification, yeah. for the bear example we have up there, carnivora is the order. Uh, that Carnivora for mammals is like mantodia, all mantises. Uh, and so mantises are about as closely related to one another as dogs, pandas, and, and uh, grizzly bears, and seals, and all that stuff. And then if you see a family, it's going to end in A-E, like A or E. Um, and that, so Ursidae there is the bear family. When we talk about Mantidae, when we talk about Keticidae, we're talking about a mantis family. Um, the genus and species don't have naming conventions. Like they'll look like all sorts of different, you know, names. Yeah, genus and species are kind of whatever people want to do. Um, if they're named after someone, a certain species, they'll often end with I, or if it's a, a male or a e if it's named after a, theme, a woman so you can kind of see like how how they're naming uh, like they're named after someone that way mm -hmm. yeah. uh, then you're gonna say something yeah I, I don't know will it be like a bit too confusing to bring up but uh like just that like each of these um hierarchies are kind of arbitrary on how mm -hmm. they are related in a sense yeah. So um, two families from different groups might not actually be as re like as equally related as mm. other two families compared. It really depends on when they are split in their corresponding times. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> if you imagine like would we just take this this mantis phylogeny here, this, you know, this evolutionary tree of the mantises, um, you can see like. For example, if you're looking to look at like the hymenopodids, which are over here, right, or the oxy, which are like this entire section here, the hymenopodidae, you could imagine that they're going to be much more like closely related within that family to another group uh, or another family, for example. So these these within group relatedness um, is kind of how we group things, um, and we'll get into how we do that later as well. How oh, so right. have typically oh. done that later. Um, yeah, so, but I guess the biggest question people often ask is why is taxonomy important? You know, why, why do we put so much time and effort into naming and classifying these organisms? And mm. ultimately the end goal is to document our biodiversity on the planet, right? Because if we see an organism, we don't necessarily know what it is unless we examine it. And as we better develop our species concept of what that organism is, we can better understand places where this organism lives. It's life history, which is what environmental and, um, and ecological necessities does it need in order to grow and survive. And we can better get to the end goal of protecting this animal. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's multiple ways to do that, but the ultimate goal of taxonomy and systematics is to understand our planet's biodiversity. Um, and document different as many species as we can. Yeah. Right. So, and yeah, I, I like that you emphasize oh yeah. that that's. Oh, I like that you emphasize that yeah. that's ultimately for the purpose of being able to better protect that biodiversity. And for a keeper, you know, for for someone who raises mantises, that can be as simple as 
some say someone gives you a mantis that you have not seen before and you're trying to figure out how to take care of it by looking at it by studying it and you can relate it to a, a similar species you have seen before and you'll have a, a better concept of that and with wild animals we can extrapolate that same principle and say okay say we're looking to conserve african elephants if there have been successes with asian elephants those can be looked at and you'll have a groundwork already from a similar species uh, and so especially with things like mantises when you're dealing with animals that are difficult to survey difficult to find in their environments you want to be able to draw on as much information from related species as you can and if you don't know what it's related to you're not going to have any of that information exactly yeah oh ben we're going to say something no nah, i'm just i'm just agreeing uh, oh, okay yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah exactly it, being able to understand how one organism works can lend a framework to helping other organisms as well. So it's it's really, really helpful to document biodiversity. So what are some methods that systemicists use typically to um, classify and find organisms? So well, first of all, in order to classify an organism, you have to have a physical specimen that's either alive mm -hmm. or dead. Um, typically, it requires the organism to be dead in order to extract, extract genetic material, um, but typical things include insect nets, uh, you know, various kinds of insect traps like the malaise trap in the third picture. Um, you use a microscope often to examine very small characters, characteristics that are on the organism itself or to look at the genital structures um, because different species in insects have unique uh, genital structures which can only mate with members of their own species typically. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, just lab equipment um, as you're doing whatever um, process you're doing. So just had a micro pet that there just to highlight. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> what is that little thing? Yeah, it's just a I, pet. <laughs> I looked at like, I know what everything is here, except for that little rocket on the right. <laughs> the oh, thing, a micro yeah. pipette? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Right, not uh, the ones I used to use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of... Um, the work of taxonomy often ends up being uh, field work because if you don't have specimens or fresh material in order to conduct your analyses or to even start an analysis, um, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you got to get it. So a lot of it ends up being field work and really trying to find these organisms in the wild. And probably one of the most important things if you're a systematicist, right, I'm sure um, Josh and Ben have gone collecting before. Um, understanding the animals and the way they behave in the field, like where mm -hmm. they like to hang out, where places to collect them, is all really important to understanding the organism and finding them in order to con conduct your analysis. Yeah, when I was younger, I used to think it was so wasteful to have you know museums full of a hundred examples of this one species. You know, I would, I would just think, why can't you leave the other ninety nine or 98 in the wild and just take a couple examples um, and you know some of the reasons as I've gotten older that I've understood why this sort of collection is important is that people do share these specimens people do loan them out to other institutions and want to be able to look to make sure they didn't just catch one mutant and they can see the range of you know variation within one species mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're making an insect collection putting it into a university or something like that those are the sort of reservoirs that people use to study so they don't have to go out and collect every time. You know, yeah. in an ideal world, that'll reduce the amount of collection that you have to do because you can use those specimens for years and years and years. Yeah, exactly. Especially when they're kept in good condition. And yeah. like Josh said, like, it's, it's very difficult when you have someone who collected one organism and described a new species entirely off that one specimen because it's difficult to say if that collection event was one actually accurate. It could be in this label, it could be that organism ended up in that place by mistake, either via, via human interaction or mm -hmm. um, perhaps the population is very fragmented there or something and it's not typically its home range. It could be any number of factors. And two, it's what having one specimen, as Josh said, there's a range of variation in a population, right? I mean, just look at, look at all of us here. We're all the same species, but you know, we're all a little different. Right. Um, having having as several dozen at least individuals, at least in from an area, at least gives you an idea of the range of variation, um, as minute as it can be, because it it lets you know that 
you know, if I collect another individual or find another individual and it falls within the sort of accepted range that I now have of variation, then it fits within the species concept that I have. Yeah, especially with mantises where if I see a male Veroplates like dead leaf and a female Veroplates dead leaf, they will look like different species to me unless I knew that those two would mate. Yep, exactly, yeah. Or even just losing them, like... Some of Losing the older them. collected specimens, you'll just have like one really decrepit, like old specimen that's like falling apart with only one limb. Oh, sad. Oh. If you lose the the type specimen, like it might be a while until you might find something else, and even then, it's gonna be a really hard process ben. to redescribe something. Ben. Uh, oh, am I muted? What? No. What's a type oh. specimen? <laughs> oh, type specimen. So, um. Correct me if I got something wrong, but it's it's kind of like the original, like uh, kind of like the blue, the reference point of that mm -hmm. specimen. So um, right. I I don't know if it's like exactly the first one that's caught. Mm. The well, which type depends on. So a holotype would be the original that right. that species yeah. is described on. But then and like the a paratype. paratype would be like. If the original specimen is lost, the paratype serves as a very close approximation. So it's like a secondary copy that's so similar to the first that it's designated a paratype because it's almost the holotype, but it's just not the holotype. So okay. in the event the holotype is damaged or missing, it can serve as a secondary uh, specimen to, to use as a reference point. Mm -hmm. I just thought that'd be fun to ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good, good question. Yeah, I, it's, I think people would be curious about that. That's good. So, let's look at mantis diversity. Um, how many known families? Well, there are 31 currently recognized families from across the world, nine of which are in South America. Um, <laughs> but the largest familial diversity is in Asia, if you consider Asia to be, um, you know, India and China and Indo-Malaysia, that region. Um, mm -hmm. It's the largest family diversity. So we have 12 families. We have the metalliticity, which is the metallic mantises, you know, metalliticus. So um, cool. Nanomantids, which are things like propidomantis, um, leptomantelidae, which is, you know, leptomantella. Um, it's a kind of obscure genus, but if you guys look it up, it's quite cool. It's like <laughs> a very slim, stretched out, uh, small little mantis, quite quite awesome. Uh, Goni pedids, which are small little bark mantis family. So they, things like Humbertiella are and uh, Theopompa are in that family. They're like the bigger representatives in that family. Um, you have the Hymenopodidae, which Ben loves, <laughs> uh, the polymorphic stick and flower mantises. Uh, you have Empusids, uh, which there's only uh, Empusa. Passiata and Gongylus, Gongylodes, the violin mantis. I think both of them are in India. And Gongylus also gets into Thailand, apparently. So, yeah, it's <laughs> one of the few Empusids that's uh, in Asia. Toxiderids, which are the dragon mantises, right? You have Toxidera, um, Heterocada, which is in Africa. But uh, there's several other, like, obscure genera, like um, Chidukulama, which are also found in more arid regions. Um, you have the Daroplateids, so deadly mantises, as Josh was saying, inclu also includes uh, Eucomanella, the giraffe mantis, and Crazy. Uh, Pseudampusa, Pinapavanus, the peacock mantis. Uh, and then you have mantids, the classic family that most members of this, this order are in. Um, mm. So things like Hyrodula, Rhombodera, um, Tenodera are all going to be in the family mantidae. Um, so that's like the more typical mantis that you'll see. They don't really have any particular lobes or um, pronotum expansions, the pronotum being the first major segment that you see when you look at the top. Um, it's not expanded typically into anything. In Rhombodera it is, but not nearly as much as like Theropodes or something like that. Um, you have Heneids, which are small little moss mantises. Um, and within that family is Hyenia. Um, you have uh, Caliris is in, in another subfamily as well, Caliridine. Um, you have Amorphocelids, which are little, they're also a type of bark mantis, but these guys are really cool. They have these, like, um, Circe that have been 
like stretched out and flattened and they have these little like bright mm -hmm. red colors on them and they'll like wave their abdomen around like this as they're sitting <laughs> on bark um, and they're ant specialists so they're often found near uh, ant trails picking them mm. off is really cool and then you have the riventinids so things like diphobe um, it's like the only representative it was one of the few representatives there um, so yeah it's a it's a family that's more found in the middle east and uh, northern africa but it's there's a couple representatives there so yeah Asia is, Asia is quite oh. diverse, um, and while we're here, of, of these, uh, fam what's your favorite mantis family? Fun question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean... I wonder what Ben's going to pick. <laughs> ben, you want to go first? Have we been, have oh, we been yeah. correct about you? <laughs> yeah, my, my favorite is High Road. You, no, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's the fly mantises. But why? <laughs> But why then? I, I don't know. Like they're, they're they're just so diverse. Like you you got you got the really stout the really stout boxer mantises in um, mm -hmm. Aquamantidae and um, and also Oxypil. Oh, wait, no. Acromantinae and Oxypil. <laughs> yeah, subfamilies. Yeah. <laughs> but even even ghosts are in there. Right. Mm -hmm. and, Which and, is actually. Oh, no, you go. And Sibyllinae, but yeah. What, yeah. what were you about to say? Oh, I was just going to say that leads me to a point that I'm going to make after this as well. Um, that's a good example. I love the big ones, the big the big green boys, the big stick ones, anything enormous and Im imposing and intimidating, I really like. Uh, and I I have to admit, I really love the Toxidarids. The, the cat eyes, I mean, they're the accessible ones, but then the ones that we see on, on Facebook and get jealous of just warm my heart. What about a Acalo, Acalothroa, the Indian stick? Oh, yeah. Oh, Acalothroa. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they nice too. Yeah. Those cool. legs. <laughs> I have to I have to go with Josh here. I got to say Toxidarids are one of my longtime favorites. I think. They're just very interesting because they're uh, butterfly specialists. The a lot of the Asian species, especially the Toxidorini, the subfamily that includes like Toxidera and Protoxidera, um, they're butterfly specialists. So they're very well adapted to catching butterflies, and they have very interesting um, spination on their forelimbs to help them do that. So the way their spines are arranged is really ideal for catching butterflies. Yeah, um, and they're just really cool. I mean, as like. Uh, others would agree i'm sure they're they're just really large like elegant looking mantises so they're quite awesome but um but yeah, yeah. ben when you described your hemipodids you described the boxers and the ghosts mm -hmm. and the orchids mm -hmm. and i think a casual observer would look at boxers ghosts and orchids and think that they all go into different families you know the, yeah some of the boxers are really distinct huge front limbs some of the orchids are like no other mantis, you can't mistake that for another kind of animal. And then you would put the ghost probably with the dead leaves in Deropletiony. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a, an example of a family that in itself is super diverse, super wide. And then for instance, mm -hmm. Lohit, you could sum up the entirety of amorphosility with they have long Circe and red spots. Like they're all quite similar to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that Asian list there is a, a, also a good example of how we'd, we'd mentioned earlier that just because they're in the same family doesn't necessarily mean that they are incredibly similar to each other. Yeah. And that taxonomy yeah. is in a way there um, still more arbitrary if you're just looking at those levels. Yeah, exactly. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that really quick because I wanted to just talk about like, I think as more research has been being done, I mean, previously a lot of people did what came intuitively, as Josh said, where you look at, you know, you look at ghosts and dead leaves and you're like, oh, you know, they're like probably pretty closely related because they, mm -hmm. they both have like dead leaf mimics. And people looked at like all the bark mantises across the world, like um, Humbertiella and then litter goose in South America and they were like, oh, you know, those guys are all bark mantises. They're probably pretty closely related. But Makes sense. as soon as genetic work was done, we're finding that that's not the case at all. And these types right. of body plans and defensive strategies have evolved multiple times in different groups, which is really fascinating because what this means is basically like 
the uh, certain species or a group of mantises, either as a result of um, continents separating or an introduction to a new place or, uh, arrive and there's these available niches where predators um, like or other mantises haven't evolved to take advantage of them and mm -hmm. we see again and again there's these speciation events where they will evolve similar body plans to fill an available niche in the environment a niche being an available spot in the ecosystem where they can kind of carve out a living right they have a certain territory certain types of food that they eat certain places that they live that is typically mm -hmm. not going to be as um, like the way they don't experience as much competition compared to other places. So, yeah, mm -hmm. we see this like repeated evolution of the similar body type. So things like the Dragusa and the Opampa and the Dragusa being in South America, the Opampa being in Asia and the Opampella being in Africa, they've all evolved <laughs> these very similar body plans, but they're all from different ancestral origins. So. Even going to this order is quite right? a cool case of yeah. like repeated convergent evolution where there's these similar body plans that coincide across the world independently which that is so confusing yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it it's, is it's... bothering me a little bit <laughs> with, the, with the flowers though like um, oh, yeah. um, so I, I remember reading that that one paper uh like one one of the things with the hym hymenopodids is that they don't really have a synapomorphy, which um, a synapomorphy is like a trait that ties in and identifies it as that group. Good definition. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of synapomorphy. And um, I don't think hymenopodids have one, or it's like a very, very specific one mm. that I don't remember. I, I think I think it's a combination of genetic marker and the number of posterior ventral spines, which are going to be the spine. Ah. If you imagine the mantis four limb, it's going to be the outer spines that you'll see the really big ones. Mm -hmm. right. I think they typically have four, in some rare cases five, but I think it's a combination of that with genital characters and the genomic mm -hmm. markers that put them together. Well, this yeah. leads me to a, I think a question that'll be good for um, all the all the non scientists as well. Um, why are genetic factors a more definitive way of determining the species relatedness than morphological characters? You know, why does right. that supersede the appearance? Right. So, uh, as I was saying before, you have these like repeated evolutions of similar body types, right? So if you're going to go purely morphological, I'm not saying that morphological characters aren't helpful, morphology being a study of the body and the anatomy and the shape of the body and body proportions and things like that. Um, not saying that it's not helpful, but you can easily be led astray into thinking that a similar body shape or body type means relatedness automatically. And we know that's not the case because um, genes evolve certain genes evolve in certain rates and when if you can if you compare the genomes of certain uh or compare the genes of certain genes between species and you examine the differences and mutations of certain um certain group sections of that gene then based on the rate of evolution of those genes you'll know that this species and this species is like this distance apart and that's typically how how we organize and categorize um, mm -hmm. and like create a phylogeny. We, we examine like evolutionary rates between different sections of a gene and multi in multiple genes especially too, um, not just one, so mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, the next thing I was gonna bring like go to is what makes a family since we're kind of <laughs> segueing there. Um, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so uh, I guess wow. We started talking about um, synapomorphies, which are diagnostic characters that create, um, that unite things under a certain clade. Um, that can be a clade being like a group uh, or a section of phylogeny that's, uh, you know, monophyletic. So monophyletic means it's not, it's uh, it's a group that shares some sort of character. All it's descendants. Not a member or a, yeah, a, yeah, all descendants. Yeah, share that character. Like we would um, want in an ideal taxonomic world. We would want all of our families to have come from, e each of them has one common ancestor that it would have come from, right? Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So typically, um, in in modern taxonomy, um, in addition to genomic methods that we mentioned, um, once the phylogeny is kind of sorted out uh, using uh, genetic comparison, then people try to start applying morphological characters or external characteristics to each family, so that mm-hmm. when you see at so then you have now that you have an idea for what makes like what characters are diagnostic of a certain family if you now see something else that you don't know then you can put it in a certain family based on these characters that we've now designated belong to that family yeah so, for example i these are these two images are from uh Brannick et al um in 2017 it's the praying mantis uh manual of nomenclature and morphology um so this left image is just kind of highlighting the different parts the large parts of the mantis um, mm-hmm. within within each of these sections they can be broken down further but these are kind of like the major sections that um, a taxonomist should be readily familiar with um, the picture on the right I I really like because it so highlights cool. a bunch of different mantis forelimbs and you can really see how the spination is so different in each one so um, image a is Chaitisa it's a uh, Josh mentioned the family earlier. It's a really primitive mantis species, very roach-like. Uh, they don't have any solid spines. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are all kind of flimsy, kind of uh, softer spines, and they don't have a large apical spine either, like the other species you can see. They don't have this big spine at the end of the last segment. So this yeah, is a I- really early branching group. I feel um, like a, hiss- a hissing cockroach could kill something as effectively with its front legs as yeah, one of those could. If not, if not more, honestly. The, these guys have yeah. spines. <laughs> um, B is Metalyticus. So you can see, you know, it's got that really long spine here. Um, this is one of the discoidal spines. So this spine is really elongated for some reason. We don't know why yet. Um, mm-hmm. Typically, the discoidal spines in most mantises um, and the... Um, not posterior ventral spines, but the um, the inner spines, they actually are, um, they're actually sensory. So they will actually collapse inward a little bit um, if you touch them. Uh, so yeah. it, it could be that this is some sort of tactile thing. I mean, it's hard to say. Um, C and D are different uh, amorphocelids. So amorphocelids, they actually don't have very many spines, if at all. They have their major spine Just here one, yeah. and here. And then they have like one, sometimes two. I think so interesting. C, C is Amorphocelis and D is Perlamantis, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, so these guys, you can see, they're kind of they're kind of more for like grabbing and squishing something, not so and much for like stabbing it. You'd um, said those are ant specialists, right? Typically, yeah, yeah. yeah. At least the like, Amorphocelids in Asia are. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah like I when think you it, think of the the small, very hard, like compact sort of body structure of an ant it Mm -hmm. makes sense that you'd want to wrap around that thin waist crush the you know crush the thorax rather than try to stab through that dense armor Mm -hmm. yeah and then e is a type of thespid so thespids are a new world species so they're in the americas and south america Um, they're typically these long thin mantises though not always some of them are very stout and robust but um, many of them have evolved these like spearing forelimbs where they have several spines at the end like this and a really short segment and they'll use it to actually just stab their prey, um, which is pretty cool. It's pretty metal. Um, so mm-hmm. you can imagine they probably typically go after softer bodied stuff. Um, F is, I think, schizocephala or something That's like that. Well, what, what um, I would guess. Oh, weird yeah. is. Yeah, they're really an odd species. Again, long and skinny. Uh, and then G is a type of oxypiline. Uh, it's one of the boxer mantises. I forget which species exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would have almost see... guessed maybe, I don't know. I, I would have guessed that too, or maybe even acromantis. Oh, maybe. So, I mean, I, I might be misremembering, honestly, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, you were, what were you going to say, Josh? Yeah. Oh, two notes from this, um, mm-hmm. both very casual. Number one, that Metalyticus front leg with the gigantic spike would make an amazing metal album cover as well. Um, <laughs> and second, I think we've got an upcoming photo contest of posting 
the front leg of a mantis and seeing who can identify it just from that. Oh, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Also, I, I the, really, uh, uh, no. you go first. Go, go ahead. Oh, I, I was oh. going to say like. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben, go. I'll, I'll... Okay. <laughs> uh, I just, I just want to say, if you got a chance, like, uh, you should look up like the schizocephala, like full arm, because this isn't really showing so how weird. weird they are completely. Yeah. Like yeah. the coxa, which is like the next, like the 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 segment behind its its um, front limb shown here is like yeah, extremely like long. So they're like yeah. the T Rex of like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This is okay yeah. to say. they're really odd, 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 long guys. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to show this not only because it shows you guys some of the diversity in how mantises in different parts of the world and different lifestyles are kind of capturing their prey, um, but mm -hmm. it's it's to show you that each of these structures have evolved over time to fit a specific purpose. So. Something about the way this mantis lives and what it's eating makes these shapes ideal for whatever it is, for whatever the species is. So right. you can see that, you know, even even A and B, which are both bark mantises, they have very different structures. And that could be due to any number of factors, um, you know. So it's, it's a really cool um, diagnostic trait because typically these forelimb structures are mostly retained um, in a family. Things like the number of posterior ventral spines, which are these outer spines, which are going to be right here. Those are typically retained in a family. They will usually fall within a certain range, with usually a difference of two, so like six to eight, or like three to four, or something like that. Um, and same with the number of uh, like inner spines as well. Those will typically also fall into a range. And these these spination patterns can be used as a diagnostic character because it's not like certain members of the family are just going to rapidly evolve a, a large difference in the number of spines. It takes time for these spines to evolve the way they do or the structure to evolve the way they do. So these are very useful diagnostic characters. Um, and then in addition to that, you have things like you use comparative morphology. So Comparative morphology, as I said, morphology is the study of the body and the shape and the proportions. Comparative morphology is just comparing the body shape and proportions to other individuals and other species. So you're examining, for example, like the height of the head to, you know, in one species versus another, or like the ratio of the width of the pronotum to the length of the pronotum. Um, things like that. And over time, you'll start to notice that, you, again, in, in certain families, typically these fall under certain patterns um, and certain ranges. And so you can kind of use those as diagnostic characters as well. Um, and then the most popular uh, method and the most popular diagnostic character is genital characters. So um, male mantises have three um, sclerites, which are three small segments that make up their genital complex, and typically scientists will remove these and examine them under a microscope and describe the shape and um, the proportions of different sections. And using that, they can not only either identify it as a new species or um, identify it to a species, but they can use it to examine similarities within related species and unite them under a certain family by shared character. So it's a combination of many, many things. Um, this is uh, for the morphology, at least. Um, yeah, so next, I wanted to go into what makes a species, um, which is a bit, which is a much more complicated, I think, subject, because as Ben mentioned, and as Josh has mentioned, the way we are putting labels on animals is somewhat arbitrary because it's humans trying to classify other things into this kind of box, right? We're trying to say that everything that fits in this box is one thing, but as we know with variation, there's always gonna be a few individuals that are kind of just on the edge of the box or just outside the box, but then they don't fit into another box. So then what do you do, right? So uh, first, um, 
I don't know how your guys' uh, paleo history is, um, but I wanted to talk about um, Pangea and plate tectonics, if you guys are up for that. So um, yeah, uh, I, I'll just to introduce the concept of Pangea, Pangea was a supercontinent. Um, it's originally how all the land masses on Earth were together, and over time, they began to split apart. And we know that, you know, continents move slightly over time. Um, but this movement in land masses can lead to populations being split, populations colliding, um, and that can cause speciation events by distance, right? So um, I think, I mean, I know uh, I chatted with Ben a lot about orchid mantises and their split population. You want to talk a little bit, bit about that, Ben, since it's kind of like a pretty important thing that's come up recently for orchid mantis keepers. Yeah, so um, they have, so orchid mantises, uh, supposedly they are their own, like there's only one species, Hymenopus coronatus, but um, historically there has been two other species uh, identified that have been uh, unified now, which is um, Hymenopus bicornis and Hymenopus coronatodi. I think coronatodes has been is is found in China and bicornis is in Indonesia would be my first guess. Like, but but then they were all merged into one, which is coronatus, which now we all know and we have. But um, later on, like we can like starting in the hobby, we start noticing like each place each locality of orchid mantises kind of had has its own like minute variations so for example the malaysian uh orchid mantises from malaysia are actually um slightly smaller relatively i think and and uh, indonesia and in, it's the other other way oh it's the other way malaysia's around in, yeah malaysia's bigger okay right? malaysia's bigger indonesia's yeah. smaller and they are also found in thailand um vietnam even all the way in yunnan china which uh, it's historically speaking, like that whole strip in Southeast Asia is like a Southeast Asian like rainforest. It's all interconnected. And so it, whether they are a species or not, uh, whether these, um, these different localities really are different species or just like a slight local variation, we're not sure. But some have reported the reason at least hypothesized that uh, the reason why sometimes orchid boots don't hatch is because they were a male and female mantis from a different like local. So maybe an Indonesian one mated with a Malaysian one, and maybe that actually produced an infertile ooth. So we're not sure. <laughs> yeah, but we want to make sure to yeah, keep yeah. it within the locality, mm -hmm. just to be yes. sure. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, yeah, Josh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that also might be the reason why uh, if you guys are seeing mantises posted with just the genus name, uh, maybe the, like, for instance, Heterokita sp, sp with a period, or SPP, that is short for species or multiple species, and they would say that if they aren't certain what the species is. Say somebody finds one out in Africa in a location where there are multiple species, and it's a nymph, and they haven't been able to look at the genitalia or look at that those adult features to be sure what it is. It would be very unwise for someone to buy that individual and want to breed it with one of their confirmed other species because it's it's an unknown species. It may turn out to be the same, but if it's different, those two probably aren't going to be able to breed very well. And if they can, those offspring may not come out perfectly normal either. Uh, and so for things like the orchids, things like if you're getting in like new blood from a mantis uh, from a different location, you do want to be very careful that you're getting one that's one that could interbreed with it if they were all in the wild from two very distinct populations may have trouble even if they're not, you know, different species. Yep. And yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I mean, as as uh, you know, with the orchid mantis situation, it's become pretty clear, like things that 
look the same aren't at least to us just for their bare eyes aren't always the same species right and it sometimes takes that extra close look of looking under a microscope to notice really minute differences because oftentimes the differences between really similar looking species are literally just as small as the number of spines on their forelimbs or some little spots of color on a certain part of the body or tubercles that are found you know on like a forelimb somewhere that aren't present on another species so sometimes these differences to us may seem minute and we may overlook it but in terms of the ability for the species or those two individuals to mate it could be a huge difference and i i think this is a perfect segue into um um you know why taxonomy is important to keepers and breeders um and i just wanted to pull a couple examples here of like several mantises that i think are are pretty important to how tough it can be to name a species so i mean first picture here we have the orchid mantis right um if you know if we knew nothing about this species it would both be most likely that we would think the male is a different species than the female right it, it would not make sense in our heads seeing most mantises that a male that small could mate with a female that big. But yet, uh, this is the case. Um, in the second panel here, we have um, Metacanthops uh, amazonica. Uh, this is a recently described genus, actually. Um, this male was previously placed in the genus Matilia. Um, but after finding the female, um, researchers realized that it is a completely different genus. Um, and there's several like features that you know distinguish it from the males, but this is, can be a reason why um, single individual descriptions can be problematic, um, at least in terms of classifying organisms, because it's not truly representative of the population and sexual dimorphism or variation among the species. So, um, yeah, and and just like Josh was saying, oftentimes uh, when people are finding mantises in the wild, there's several, there's going to be several similar looking species in the area um, and making sure that we are collecting the same species or we're actually breeding the same species is pretty important as hobbyists. Yeah, Ben, you were gonna say something? Oh, Ben, I can't hear you. I think you. you're muted. I, I wanna, okay, oh. yeah, I'm muted, sorry. So I'm, I'm yeah. just, wondering like i never really collected in tropical places but uh mm. or even light traps but i've heard mm. males are really easy to light trap but mm. females are kind of hard to find um yes. like i i remember searching up in like the taiwan hobby they have um phyllotheles coronatus which is uh you know like phyllotheles mm. like the really long horns like um they look like ghosts but long <laughs> but yeah, um yeah like Phyllotheles coronatus is like a moss mimic too and um their females are extremely rare like well the species themselves are already very hard to find but uh the males at least you could light trap the females like they are even rarer than that like a light trap could never really get it and so uh, i wonder if like that occurs with other species too like you just don't even have a female or like you only have a few females found and a bunch of males from light traps yeah um mm -hmm. oh some with some beetles that's the case too where one sex will be much more likely to be attracted to either bait or lights uh, and then there are also weird cases um particularly in paleontology and in like oceanic biology where they'll only have certain individuals um like a certain sex. And there was a really cool story that came up uh, with something called a whale fish, um, where the females, males, and young all looked incredibly different and were kept in collections for so long where they thought, oh, it's kind of weird that we only have males of this one species. Uh, and then some genetic testing revealed that they, the female, young, and male were all the same species that looked super different in each stage of its life. Um, and so I think, Ben, that you're you're probably onto something where there, there are quite a few species, especially those that have been described by one specimen, where maybe it, maybe the females out there are unknown, or maybe it's a, a weird one of another species. Yeah, um, and I've collected only a little bit in the tropics, but 
yeah, males are much more prevalent at lights, just because, you know, in mantises, males are typically the ones that are able to fly. Females can sometimes fly, but they're typically not as attracted to lights, um, even if they can, with the exception of a few uh, genera, um, like Vades being an example, females and males both will fly to lights. But that that is a reason why it, it can be difficult, you know, to when you're presented with a new individual of something and you only have a male as representative because it's much easier to collect. Um, it's difficult to, to find a female or even describe the species if, you know, if you're not comfortable describing it off one specimen. So it's definitely a tough balance because you either choose to note the biodiversity and you might be inaccurate in that assessment or you choose to leave it and you might never again find that individual. You know, that's just how the nature of findings these animals are in the, in the wild, you know, they're just very good at what they do. Um, finding them just walking around this is really unlikely. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I guess as we're wrapping this up, just there's a Q and a at the end guys. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask, we'll get to them. We're almost done with our, our portion. So we'll stop laughing so much. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so, I think I just wanted to summarize by kind of tying together points that we made throughout uh, throughout the segment and talking about why taxonomy is ultimately useful to breeders and keepers, right? As, as Josh said, um, understanding how one species lives and uh, can be taken care of is an excellent template to be able to keep other species that are related to it, especially if they're in the same region. Um, you just might need to modify a few things based on the species because, you know, there, there is going to be species specific variation, but it might not be much, if at all. So it's a great way to not only understand the biology of the animal, but also how to keep it in captivity. Um, and as Ben was talking about with the Hymenopus problem, um, we want to keep track of locales as much as possible. It's very important that we do so because we the last thing we want to do is send a male or a female to a friend who's trying to breed a species and we got that same species from a different locale and it turns out to actually be a different species. Um, it's estimated that something like 40 to 50%, if not more of our biodiversity in insects is still undescribed. So there's a lot of animals that we haven't documented properly yet that are out there. And we don't know if what we have might be one of those species that looks the same as a species that we know has been described. Um, and there's several cases of this. I mean, there's several, genera in mantises that are very confusing, right? So you have like Creobroder, Hyrodula, uh, Spadromantis, they're all very similar looking, a lot of them. Um, they, they're separated only by a few genital characters or a few very minute coloration differences. Um, and it can lead to a lot of confusion because if you have individuals from different locales and you try to mate them together thinking they're the same species because they were labeled that way, you might not end up with fertile eggs and then you just lost both. So, you know, it's important to keep track of locales and where you're getting what. Uh, yeah. And I think, um, I don't know uh, if Josh, you maybe want to take this, uh, how cool it is that we have the opportunity to keep some of these species because um, it, it's happened several times that um, species that haven't been described found their way into the mantis hobby before they're described by scientists. I think uh, Rombo mantis longipennis, the candy mantis, is a perfect example. Um, I know Josh really loves that species, so <laughs> you want to chat a bit about um, situations like that. Yeah, I mean, you were the one who started posting pictures of those and making them known. I still haven't gotten to keep them. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's the case with species identification, with uh, a lot of behaviors and stuff, too, is that the first people to see it are the hobbyists. Um, with crabs, there's a whole bunch of freshwater crabs and shrimp that have been first identified as something unique, kept for generations in aquaria, and then someone looks at it and goes, oh, that doesn't have a Latin name yet. Uh, cool. And with mantises, I really would not be surprised if that was the case with some of those confusing genera like Creobroder, uh, or with the fact that we as hobbyists are able to keep large, large numbers of different Urodula species, different Rhombotera species, 
um, we're going to be able to provide that specimen base and that knowledge base um, for researchers who might want to finally sit down and divide those up in a way that makes a little bit more sense. Um, the ghost that I have out right now is a great example too, where it's still, depending on who you ask, uh, unclear if illudens and paradoxa are the same thing, or if they're just like regional variations, sort of races of the same species or not. Um, and we don't know yet, but maybe we will one day. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I think there's, we like, as readers and keepers, you have a really awesome chance to see a lot of cool things. And it's just for, for the reasons Josh said above, like, oftentimes stuff we have, like, we don't actually know what it is. Like, people might think they know, and they just give it a label, but it's possible it's incorrect, you know. Um, so that's why keeping track of locales is important as best we can to avoid any potential issues and you know you could contribute to someone's research one day with the animal that you're just keeping for fun you never know so that's yeah, an important thing to, to to look out for um so uh, do you guys have any like closing thoughts um hello i just want to say um that i do think it's really cool that this topic managed to make it into a live stream um, yeah. And whether it was intended to be this one that won, or whether it was actually supposed to be taxidermy, the world also <laughs> may never know. Um, but for anybody who has stayed with us this long, I just applaud you for that, because it's dense. Yeah. A lot of people don't want to deal with it. Um, but if you're, if you're interested, don't be ashamed of that either, because it's really cool when you look at it. It's really freaking cool, yeah. And um, yeah, and, and like I know it's a lot of information just like thrown in your face. Um, our hope for this is if people are interested enough, we would do more of like a in-depth one at a later date where we go into some of the families and subfamilies and kind of break down uh, some of the diagnostic characters and like what makes what's like special to each family and things like that. So people are more familiar with as many different mantises as possible. Because I know a lot of people in the hobby, they're used to you know, the Hyrodula and the Rombadera mm -hmm. and like the Orchid Mantises, but there's a lot of really freaking cool like species and genera out there that you just don't hear about normally. So uh, really like to do that at some, some point if people are interested. So I, I've even like, as we're talking now, I had, um, I had an idea of like some sort of either a stream or a video. Uh, it's just, uh, there's this YouTube, channel that I really like that goes into like biogeography like they lean really onto how populations disperse like how mammals moved into the new world and how each continent has its own mammal like species like well each old mammal group within their area and how that group migrated like, for example how mammoths get to the new world and how the armadillos, like the, the South America, North America interchange. And I bet we could do something like that with mantises. Like yeah, maybe not that would be cool. definitive like answer, but at least like this could be possible. Yeah, yeah, the hypothesizing thing. That would be really cool. Yeah. Like a speculative uh, mm -hmm. distribution stream, like stream or something like that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. It, even pulling yeah. up like just a very gradual map on how those continents like connect and how it may explain how a certain species ended up somewhere yeah that'd be awesome yeah. like how india doesn't have ghost mantises <laughs> so ghost oh, mantises india. probably got to madagascar from africa yes oh that's okay. what i think yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so yeah. i guess if let's do a little q a really quick Do we have any questions from the audience? I saw uh, one. I saw one that says like explain the roach and mantis. Um, oh, relationship. Yeah, yeah. So, so mantises and roaches evolved from primitive uh, insects called roachoids. Um, you know, mantises and roaches are fairly closely related. They are both in Dictyoptera, the superorder Dictyoptera. Um, but other than that, they did split 
pretty a, a long while ago. There's there's several uh, intermediate orders between roaches and mantises that are now extinct. Um, so, I they're probably separated. I think it's like something around like 135 million years or something like that separates them evolutionarily, if not a little bit more. I think the old it's and that's the only estimated date I think because the oldest mantis is that Jurassic. Known as, yeah, yeah, some yeah, Jurassic, yeah, late Jurassic, I believe, okay. or early Cretaceous. So they're separated by a long ways, um, long ways away, if not, if not. So more, if we, um, if we yeah. put it that way, then uh, in that case, going back to um, like when things split, a mantis mm -hmm. and cockroach, even though they're relatives, they are still more distantly related to each other than we are to a dog. Yes. Yeah. Be because um, they split way earlier than we did. Yeah. yeah. Put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good way to give people a frame of reference. They are they are that different. There's mm -hmm. that much time of evolution separating these two groups of animals versus us. <laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty crazy to think about. Um, all right, let's see. And then someone asked, I heard there may be two new Darapati species being reintroduced into the hobby, Rombaka and Sarawaka. Um, yeah, so I'm not on top of my Asia tropical uh, paleotropical taxonomy at the species level, I, if I remember correctly, I think Rhombica was a synonym for Deropodius lobata and Sarawaka was a synonym for Deropodius truncata. So I don't think that there are any longer a valid species. So just to explain to people why that kind of synonymy occurs, that happens when a species has been described and then another researcher finds another individual of a species of that species, but it may look slightly different. Again, this is part of the natural variation that we were mentioning earlier. And based on this natural variation that they see in either like a few individuals that they caught, they describe it as a new species. But then further examination at a later date by genital structures or other characteristics, um, people realize that it's a level of natural variation that's present within the species. And so the species that was described first keeps its species epithet. So in this case, Arapati truncata keeps its, it keeps that species. Sarawaka is now within Arapati truncata. So now there's only Arapati truncata left and Arapati sarawaka is no longer a valid, valid species. Just like what happened with the orchids, but um, yes, they got, they might possibly be split again. So it could happen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, there is splitting and collapsing that occurs in taxonomy. And it's just entirely based on what specimens we have and the latest method of categorization that we use, whether that's genomic or morphological. Hmm. Oh, another question. Um, the difference between mantis species that are extremely similar, like Rhombodera species, and what separates them from each other? Oh, yeah, <laughs> these, these uh, confusing genera. Um, so it's going to be different based on the genus that you're looking at. Typically, all the males and females will have different genital characters. Obviously, unfortunately, that's not ex an external character. You can't see that just by looking at it. In Ramadera, it's kind of nice because the shields are often a little bit different based on species. Sometimes the marking on the underside of the shield is a little different based on species. Um, the size and shape of the hood is a little different. The markings on the forelimbs can be a little different. I mean, other than that, externally, there's not that much that separates them besides the actual range that you might find them. But even then, several species overlap in range. So the best the best way for Rambadera is genital characters. But for other... Um, other genera, it can be different um, and much more confusing. <laughs> so, <laughs> or, or pull up a magnifying glass because, um, like for Crea broaders, I'm not like I'm absolutely not sure on how to identify them, but I have seen like I forgot what species is which, but like there are some that are identified by like a few few little spikes at the like pronotum edge, could be oh, like really? diagnostic okay. traits like. Like there, oh. there are slight different like serrations, okay. and like gotcha, even gotcha. hind wing like coloration. Yeah. Like if the base is like 
have the red color or not. Uh, yeah, that could also be a telling. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the time with things like that, it's not because that trait is particularly like super advantageous. Like for instance, a, a Rambadra population that has the half red base as opposed to a fully red base of the wing, it they didn't survive because of that half red base most likely. But just as the process of of geography goes on and some of those half red base ones start breeding with others and moving further away from the population otherwise, they're going to become genetically distinct enough that they become their own species, even though they still look very similar because they're in a similar environment, it's just they might be further away now. Um, yeah. And so sometimes it is extremely subtle like that. Uh, I know yeah. that there are crickets where if you look at laboratory specimens, particularly with the females, you cannot tell a difference between them under a microscope. But they're different species because they hatch at different times of the year, they sing different songs, and so they never interbreed. They might even live in the same field and just become mature in different months and sing different songs. And so they've been breeding separately for years and years and years and years, even if they could still match up if they wanted to. Or, yeah. or even... And you go first. Oh, no, I was just going to say these like these cases of speciation, um, these sympatric cases of speciation where two, an original parent population is present in the same habitat and then various factors within that habitat drive certain populations apart. It can even be like places in the foliage they like to hang, for example, like just something as small as that, as long as it's repeated over time and it sticks in that population they will separate and become different, but similar looking species. And so that can be a challenge when identifying stuff that's very similar looking. Mm -hmm. Or even, uh, I don't know if mantises have that case, but like ring species where like, for example, a hypothetical species of animal, there's a mountain mm -hmm. separating the populations. And so the population only lives at the base of the mountain surrounding the whole mountain. And they could only mm -hmm. mate with populations next to each next to each other. Right. So um, eventually, there is gene flow like within the whole ring, but maybe right. the the far ends would be so distantly related at a time they won't be able to interbreed, but their genes right. could flow to the other side. So it's still one species, but yeah. it could be very different. Which maybe maybe that's what happened to the orchids because like that whole strip of right. like Southeast Asia rainforest. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. Yeah. That's, that's and, um, kind of and it's also fragmented by uh, because like the Southeast Asia rainforest is actually like very different for, to what it used to be. Like it used to be all interconnected, mm -hmm. but like human human activity has really fragmented it up. So yeah. like, maybe that might just be why like it's all separated because like yeah. they they had minute differences separated now because of human like environments and now they're getting more and more distinct on their own right. hypothesis right there possible <laughs> yeah there's just like there's just so many questions you could ask about why species are the way they are it's just a really fascinating topic so right well on that same note i don't know if you guys know but i have a, a quick hypothesis as a way to possibly answer christian's question here of why do why does Deroplatus desiccata have a different number of instars than other in, others in its genus? Like, how would you answer that question? Do you know? Wait, wait sorry, could you say that again? Why oh, does Deroplatus desiccata have a different number of instars than other members of the genus? Oh, so I have I have a hypothesis with Deroplatus desiccata. Ooh, and I wonder if it's the same as mine. It it involves Hyrodula. I don't know if this does as well, but it does not. Okay, <laughs> so I I am of the opinion that I think, as we know, these body types have evolved multiple times um, in in mantises, right? I think Deroplatus is it's Desiccata is a it's pretty well established that it's like an early branching member in that genus. It's like a it's like a you call it out group, I guess, for the rest of the group, um, but. I think it and hi so okay hierodula I think is a hodgepodge of a bunch of differently things that should be different genera and I so think that's known <laughs> yeah um 
I think Hyrodrilla membranesia and Rhombodera extensicolis should be in the same genus. So that's that's one thing. If you look at them, they're very similar. And we know that the hood shape has evolved multiple times in mantids. Mantidae, it is mantid. Um, <laughs> and so I think I can very, if you look at the ooth morphology of Deropodes desiccata, it's very similar to membranesia. I think they are somewhat closely related. I don't know how closely related, but I can, in my mind, I can see there being a case to be made given the sympatry of these species that Hyrodula membranesia, Rhombodera extensicolis, they're kind of like a, another early branching group within that lineage, within that clade. Um, and that's, that's how it works in my mind. And if you look at the cranial morphology, the body proportions, um, coloration we know is super variable in mantises, even within the same species, and it can evolve very quickly and differently, even among related individuals or related genera or species. So I don't hold color as like a super diagnostic character at the genus or family level. At the species level, sure, but yeah, I think genera and family, it's it's not as strong of a character. So in my mind, that's that's what I think. I mean, I we have to do like a genomic analysis to say for sure, but that's just my hypothesis. And that, and since Membranesia has eight and nine instars in males and females, that's why I would think that, yeah. That's another clue. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. These, let me see. The oh, what's, what's your theory, Josh? I'm, I'm curious. Ah, so yeah, my less scholarly, um, or I guess less less based on other features of other genera could be that uh, the ancestors of desiccata and the other genera or the other members of the genus um, a mutation occurred that caused a differing number of instars which then set them on a different reproductive schedule or could have even made it so that they could not reproduce based on that size uh, difference and so that could be an origin of where the the point where a set are created with that mutation of a different instar number, uh, then proceeds to make enough of a rift between the two that they become different species. Right, um, right. Yeah. But completely hypothetical and without yeah, I mean, a yeah, real way to prove it. Yeah, we have, yeah, it, it's all hypothetical. It's just for a fun discussion, I think. <laughs> That's a good question though, whoever, whoever asked that. Um, it's a really good question. Interesting. Um, Reading comments right now. Uh, if they mate and produce offspring, the progeny will be infertile. Well, if they're hybrids. Uh, wait, yeah, typ wait. typically they're either sterile or they fail right. to hatch. It's one of the two. And that's um, the definition of a, spe a species, loosely speaking. That's the most yeah. widely accepted definition of species. Yeah. But then what do you do about things like servals and domestic cats, which create like savanna cats? You know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult because based on the group of animals you're talking about, the rules don't apply the same. Um, and even for plants, right? Plants can hybridize with all sorts of other species and create oh, yeah. hybrids that are perfectly fine to reproduce. So it's like, it's, it's really difficult. Um, I think you could make the case for insects for that being a case. The only problem with testing if a species is a distinct species by mating different combinations is that it's impractical. You know, we have no one was like, it's already difficult enough to mate some species, but <laughs> if, if you were to try to get all the representative potential different species and try all combinations, it's like, it's just impossible to do, you know. It's, it's so, genomic methods, genomic comparison, and and genital comparison is it's kind of the best way we have right now. The best we can do, yeah. Let's see. A little interesting thing that Phil mentioned. Um, historically, mantises are only collected in daylight. And so that's before electricity is available. So um, that's why the male and female ratio is kind of equal. But now we have light traps. Yeah. More males are yeah. described recently. And not, not many people go and collect mantises by sight anymore either. 
it's typically just done by light trapping or malaise trapping, which is, you know, malaise trapping is when insects fly into a net and climb up and then fall into like a, a little cup with like a, some sort of poison or something. Um, and of course, that's going to catch flying insects, which are typically going to be males as well. So it's it's pretty hard to sample females, yeah. With or mean accidental net swings. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, and you don't see cases, any mantises in the bush. You swing your net into it to catch a bee, and the next thing you know, oh look, there's a little uh, tenadura nymph in there. <laughs> That's seeing a mantis in a sweep netting swing is just the best feeling. Um, <laughs> You're like, oh, I didn't even mean to get you. <laughs> it is also quite, I guess, convenient for males to be the sex which is more easily collected because they do tend to have the more distinct genitalia, mm -hmm. and so I guess from a from a raw let's identify as many species as we can. If you have to pick, you'd want to get as many males as possible because the females will often be a lot harder to key out. Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult. <laughs> it's always, sampling is, can be really difficult. So, yeah. The, the methods that we use, you know, to describe and classify organisms, they're just the best that we have right now to, to do so in a way that makes sense. So, um, and as with anything, you know, when, when science finds another way to do something better that makes more sense, then that's what we'll use. But until that point, it seems genetic methods and genital comparisons are the best way to do so currently. So, yeah. Um, Christian brought up uh, Eludin's cross paradoxa produce viable offspring. That can go on the way, that could go on to reproduce. So they're the same species, question mark? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> not this again. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess the answer I, would be if you consider a serval and a domestic cat to be the same species, then you would also consider these two to be the same species. But if, I, if you would say that they're genetically <laughs> distinct enough, then you would say that they're different. And that's where it is, does become kind of a matter of opinion. I, I almost don't know. Uh, they, it's it's okay, a really so difficult case, yeah. They, the hobby had like eludens for a, for a year, but then they always end up gone within one generation. Mm -hmm. But some of them show up as eludens like. So I wonder if they came into the hobby as eludens, but because they're so similar as paradoxa, like a lot of people just accidentally crossbreed them. Or my other guess would just be not even eludens is literally just a variation so they did even if you main it eludens within eludens it's actually just a very like a paradoxa that rolled the genetic lottery in a sense to get a really tall crown and yeah. so like maybe that would just not show up in its offspring or even let not all of its offspring uh, so like my my guess on this is i i think they're uh, like you're saying it's like a case of natural variation so like when in the mm -hmm. species father cranio paradoxa you can have crest shape that looks like paradoxa where it's short and stout and then you have eludens which is very long and thin and as we like i've seen pictures of species of like intermediates like between the two where it's like slightly wider but still tall like eludens but not quite like as tall and thin as like a pure pure eludens would be so i think the the issue is because human sampling is always difficult and we don't have a great representative for the population um finding finding enough like individuals that we could compare the entire population to to say whether it's one thing or the other is difficult that's why i think personally it's a genetic variation of some sort um, because of the fact that individuals can crossbreed and produce viable mm -hmm. offspring and there are intermediates. Um, so it could be like certain localized populations have this long, thin crown selected for, but in other places it's this more short, stout crown. Mm -hmm. um, and it just depends on like something like that. So Because they even have crossing ranges. Like, yeah. they, I'd, it would be interesting if like, actually go into Africa, like just look at all the different populations everywhere <laughs> and sample them. But it's, it seems like on like uh, my, my only place that I could look now is iNaturalist. 
Yeah, no, exactly. Even then, I don't even think Illudens is on there. Uh, I I don't see like a clear line. Like it. Okay, if Illudens is only found in like Madagascar, I then sure that would. Yeah. uh, There's a separation of like the sea in between, but I don't see that. Like they're just scattered everywhere in Africa. They could easily just cross breed. Like it could happen in the hobby. It could happen in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And it's also, it is also important to remember sometimes the enormous amount of variation. Like the difference between a paradox and an illusions is tiny compared to the comparison between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. But yet those right. two are still the same species. And so, right, I, right. yeah, I think that the likely scenario is that they're the same. It's just, you know, one's the, yeah. one's the big version. Right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even like, yeah, like even for species that are unequivocally the same species, like there's a crazy amount of variation, right? Like if you like go to Google and you look at a bunch of different Corridotus rhombicus pronotum shapes, there's so much variation. Like it's, it's pretty incredible. And there's a good reason why um, initially they were, they were split into like three or four species. So um, yeah, I mean, a natural variation is very real and it can manifest in like a huge difference. So yeah, I mean, as, as Phil mentioned, like we're, we're debating it. But it's mm-hmm. it's officially uh, they're listed as an and you see, you know, the science can change if new evidence presents itself. But that's uh, why I add parentheses. I add parentheses yeah. whenever I mention it. <laughs> the yeah. illusions. Right, let's take one. <laughs> let's take one more question if someone has one, and then we can wrap it up. Um, let's see. Seems like no other questions. All right. Well, I guess we're done. Yeah. All right. Thanks for coming, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion and it at least shed a little bit of light on what (laughs) this confusing topic is. So, um, yeah, hopefully, do another one soon and uh, be seeing you guys around. Yeah. See you guys next time. See ya. Bye bye. See ya.